Hello, my name is Tristram Hooley, and I'm giving a lecture for the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences. In this, I'm talking about the issue of neoliberalism, and it's part of a series that I'm doing looking at the context for career. Now, you've probably heard this term neoliberalism before. It's thrown around quite a lot and often in not a very precise way. So this is Laurie Taylor. He, he presents a radio programme in the UK which looks at social science and he, he's banned the use of the term neoliberalism because he says that it's often thrown around to mean so many things it doesn't really end up meaning very much at all. Now he's definitely got a point and we do need to be careful about the use of this but I think neoliberalism is still a useful concept and it's one which I think I, um, I find helpful in thinking about how people's careers work. So I'm going to try and explain the term neoliberalism to you today and I'm going to try and explain why it's important for people's career. So one of the things uh, that we've covered in previous lectures is the amount of information that there is about the labour market and about the wider context. It can be very difficult I think to process all of this data and if we just start by an, to analyse the labour market or to analyse the wider context for career by accumulating data we end up just being overwhelmed. So we need some kind of theory, some kind of pattern in order to make sense of it. So we need to think about how we build up that pattern and what elements might be of that pattern. And I suppose that's why I think the concept of neoliberalism might be helpful here. So political economists and the subject of political economy is really about trying to build that kind of pattern. It's about trying to understand how the world works and how the economy works. And one of its central arguments is that there is an interrelationship between politics and the, and the economy. The economy is not just a natural phenomenon. It's not just following natural laws. It's something that is created, structured and shaped by the actions of politicians. Now, politicians do not control the economy, at least not directly. Um, they can influence it, but they can't always get it to behave in the way that they want to. But nonetheless, the kind of decisions and, and policies that are pursued at the political level help to shape the economy. And so therefore, they ultimately help to shape the labour market and the way in which people's careers work. Now, in the period after the war, a new kind of political economy was negotiated and this is a, a scene from the Bretton Woods conference which was one of the places where this was negotiated and and there were a number of features and obviously many of the the governments across the world were of different types but particularly in the west so in the non-soviet world there was a, a set of uh, assumptions about how economies should work they should be a mixed economy so they should include some kind of element of market capitalism, but they should also have some state intervention. And that kind of system uh, probably reaches its apex in the sort of welfare model uh, that we see in the Nordic countries. But the other thing that was that was uh, also agreed at this period was that there needed to be strong institutions internationally to uh, negotiate between different interests. And so we, we saw the creation of uh, things like the International Monetary Fund um, and the, the United Nations and, and the revival of things like the International Labour Organization and so on. So the idea was that this was a global system, but it was a global system that needed regulation and control, just as at the national level, it was many countries pursued essentially a capitalist system but it was a capitalist system that they sought to regulate and control. And this is the kind of uh, economic settlement that's often described as Keynesianism after the economist John Maynard Keynes. But during this period, there are also people who had problems with that. So Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek are two kind of key examples. And they argued that this was a, a form of oppression. This, uh, uh, control over the market limited what was possible and it, it limited human freedom and they argued that we needed to uh, increase human freedom by freeing up the market and allowing uh, business more power essentially in society. 
So this proved to be influential. And by the 1980s, we had a number of governments across the world uh, that were pursuing what might be described as neoliberal policies. Now, these didn't all happen straight away. There's a very big difference between being an academic or a theorist like Hayek and being a politician like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher. But nonetheless, they were influenced by these ideas and they talked about the importance of the market as a primary end of political action. And this was also very influential uh, over the longer term and proved to be influential, not just in parties of the right, like uh, Ronald Reagan's Republican Party and Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party, but also in, in parties of the left. So we might argue that if we looked in, say, France or New Zealand um, during that same period in the 1980s, that some left wing governments were pursuing many very similar policies. And Margaret Thatcher was asked what her greatest achievement was, and she said, Tony Blair. And Tony Blair was a leader of the British Labour Party, the left wing party, just as Bill Clinton was the leader of the left wing Democrat Party. And so what we see is that this, this neoliberalism is not just uh, the, the politics of right wing governments. It's also it's a, a new political settlement, a new political economy that informs the thinking, not just of, of the right, but also of the left. And it shapes what is possible. And that's one of, the, I think, the most important things about neoliberalism is although it actually hasn't been around for that long, only perhaps since the late 70s, 1980s, as it started to really influence politics, it has made a profound impact on what people believe to be possible. So let's look at some neoliberal policies. So the kinds of things that we might see neoliberal governments arguing for would be a focus on individual responsibility rather than collective responsibility. They might be keen to privatize state assets, to roll back the welfare state, to open up markets in areas where markets have not previously functioned. So for example, in, in welfare state areas like healthcare, they might bring in marketized elements to those, advocating for global free trade, um, arguing that government's role is to allow business to flourish with as little interference as possible. These are the kinds of things that we might see neoliberal governments arguing for. And this has been very heavily criticised. People say, well, it, it individualises what are structurally induced problems. You, you say that that is individual's problem uh, when some of these problems are very difficult to solve. Um, individually. So healthcare is a good example. It's very, very expensive for an individual to buy uh, lifelong healthcare. Um, and if they get ill, then they may find that they're actually paying huge amounts of money that they can't afford. It's much easier to think about healthcare as a social problem because not everybody needs it. We view it in the same way as we perhaps view insurance. So People would say, well, neoliberal policies have resulted in an individualization of problems which are actually caused by structural issues. They also would say, well, there's been an erosion of democracy. And, and Chomsky talks about the creation of a virtual Senate of investors and lenders. So the idea that rather than a government elected by the people, we have a virtual Senate which is elected by money. And Despite the idea that neoliberalism was going to result in a free market in which um, entrepreneurs would, would be able to uh, rise up to the top and um, people would be able to be freer, one of the um, outcomes of it has been that we've seen an increase in wealth and the monopolization of profits and then deepening both national and global inequality. So people who are critical of neoliberalism emphasize those things. One of the key ideas is the idea of the trickle down, that if we make rich people richer, that ultimately it benefits all of us. That's that's what um, was talked about a lot in the 80s. And what people have said is, well, if we look at that in practice, that often doesn't actually happen. So neoliberalism then is a description of a global political system. It's not a finished and stable system, uh, and it varies as we move around the world but it's rather a tendency or a project which is trying to move things in a certain political direction. 
Um, so neoliberalism is not done, um, even in countries that are, are highly neoliberal. So, for example, the United States, we would still see quite a lot of the economy being organized through the state. And so so it's it's a project, it's an ongoing project, and we can see that in, in the politics of many countries. It can be found in all countries, and it has been influenced by parties of uh, both the left and the right. And from 2008, I think when we had the global economic crash, many people have been contesting and arguing against it. And some people would say, and we'll look at this more in a future lecture, that COVID-19 may actually be hastening its demise. But it's also uh, very uh, possible that it will find a new way to move forward, as it has in previous periods of challenge. So one of the things, ways in which it really influences people's careers is that um, the logic of neoliberalism is something which is not external, not only external, it's also something which we internal. This is what Foucault calls the process of responsabilization. So it's the idea that we move uh, these structural uh, problems and we, we internalize them and believe ultimately that they're our fault, that we, ha we have responsibility for things that go wrong. So perhaps we find it very difficult to um, become highly wealthy. And we, we believe that that's because we don't have the talent or effort or energy to do so rather than because society is structurally unequal and it's very difficult for people from uh, poorer backgrounds to end up being really rich. So that's a process of responsabilization. And that's important, I think, because it starts to get to how we think about career. So I've done a search here of Google for images. And what we can see is that the, the kinds of concepts that get emphasized when we talk about career are about advancement, about getting on, about earning more money, about and then also about uh, working hard, uh, making good choices, um, navigating our way through difficult situations. So career is seen as an individual process. It's responsabilized uh, as something that is our fault and our problem, rather than uh, when we search for images on career, we don't see some of the images that give us ideas around the structural components, the context of career that I'm talking about in this series of lectures. So here are a few references for you to uh, look look further, including um, some stuff that I've written about um, how career guidance is directly influenced by neoliberalism but also some uh, resources from, from Hayek and Friedman, but also David Harvey, who, who is critical of them and wrote a very good brief history of neoliberalism. So in summary, I think we can say that neoliberalism is a way to describe the global political and economic system in which people pursue their careers. It's a political project rather than a natural phenomenon. It's been extensively criticized and challenged and people internalize its logics as well as respond to the way in which it shapes their external context. And because of that, it has shaped thinking about what career and career success is. So thank you for listening. I hope this has been useful and we'll um, look forward to seeing you again at the next lecture.